Today's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Hannah Koniawati. Hannah is an associate professor at the ANU School of Computing. Her research is on robot motion planning, uh, planning under uncertainty, integrated learning with planning, um, and computational geometry. Her work has received multiple awards, including at ICAPS, ICRA, and RSS. She was a keynote speaker at IROS and program co-chair for ICRA this year. Today's talk will be a little bit different. It's part of the PhD course run by uh, ACFR, and this one is about robotic planning. Uh, over to you, Hannah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Phil. And uh, thanks a lot, Godong, for inviting me and also for everyone for coming. So let me try to share screen. Uh, it worked before, so hopefully it works now. Okay, so. Uh, so I suppose you see the the presentation slide, right? Not the notes. Yes, you can see your yeah. presentation. Okay, sure. thanks. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do in our group, uh, which is uh, mainly on decision making under uncertainty. So I'll talk some part of the things that we we do recently, and perhaps just a little bit of introduction of our group as well. Um, so. In decision making under uncertainty, especially when we start working with robots, I think it's uh, quite clear, quite fast that we need to handle multiple different levels, multiple different types of them. So just an example, if we can have a helicopter robot that then performs um, uh, emergency medical services, for instance, then at the highest level in the mission planning, uh, when we need to actually figure out um, uh, how to bring as many victims as possible to safety, for instance, then at the mission level, we need to identify which victim to pick up first, uh, what's the strategy to pick, the, pick them up so that we can uh, save as many as uh, possible uh, without knowing the exact condition of the uh, victims, for instance. At the slightly lower level, we have a motion planning where we need to figure out what's the trajectory so that we can uh, pick up the uh, victims as safe as possible uh, without knowing the terrains, for instance. And then at the lowest level, at the control level, we might want the, uh, the robot to hover around without knowing the exact disturbances from the, uh, from the wind, for instance. So uh, all these problems seems quite different. Uh, but the question that they pose are essentially uh, similar, which is that what strategy should this robot take now so that it can get uh, good long-term outcomes despite of the various types of uncertainty that it has to deal with. Uh, and answering this question in a general manner is exactly the focus of our group. And in order for us to do this, we actually look into both the fundamental computing questions on algorithm design, on computational representation, and also on the applications. Uh, many of the applications we work on are on robotics. Uh, so many of these are, are in collaboration direct with companies and also uh, collaboration with other universities. So uh, I think I need to put a plug here uh, for uh, the ITRH that is uh, actually led by SEFR. And um, this is on inspection, robot inspection and asset management. We also have a, a project with Safran on looking into developing AI-based co-pilot for helicopter emergency medical services. And we are also a beta tester for Kinova Robotics, uh, which has been great for us because uh, we work uh, mostly on computing and the algorithm side, and they provide us with the hardware support. Uh, and, and we have a number of, a little bit of other robotics projects, but perhaps I want to talk a little bit on the outside of the robotics. We also uh, work a little bit outside of the robotics. Um, one of it is this uh, fishery management. Uh, so apparently this is making under uncertainty that we have been working on robotics can also help on how we should decide um, to manage our fish, uh, fish industry. Um, and this is in collaboration with the School of Mathematics at UQ. And uh, so this is on the application side, but obviously we also develop the algorithms and we work on a number of them. Uh, they can be classified into sort of two things. One is more on geometric motion planning, uh, where we basically look into uh, the how robots can go from one configuration to another, avoiding external, um, external constraints like obstacles, for instance. And the question here are generally, how do we enable to compute this fast enough for high degree of freedom robots. Uh, 
Um, the other part which we have also worked quite a lot on is on enabling these partially observed Markov decision processes or POMDP to become practical. Uh, so we want, uh, in all our work, we want to develop general purpose algorithms. And so if we want to handle um, to have general purpose algorithms for decision making under uncertainty, then we need to be able to, uh, we need to use frameworks that are uh, general enough for handling decision making under uncertainty. That's it, exactly what POMDP is. And that's why we spend quite a lot of time on, on this particular part as well. Uh, so I'm happy to talk and uh, answer any questions about any of this part. But uh, for this particular talk, I'm going to uh, focus on, on this, this particular work that we've done. Uh, so perhaps just a little bit of what a POMDP is. Uh, if, if you're familiar with it, uh, you can take a nap for a few minutes first, perhaps. Uh, so in POMDP is essentially uh, trying to model how agents, how robots interact with the environment. Uh, so for instance, if we have this robot, then it can perceive the environment uh, via observation, right, via sensors, and then the processing of the sensor data. Uh, but uh, the main thing that we consider is that uh, there's generally uncertainty in the observations uh, that, that this uh, robot perceives. So either it's because the measurement errors, or it might be because errors in computing the, uh, the in processing the sensor data. And so, so those kind of uncertainty. And that's actually captured in POMDP as a conditional probability function. Uh, then the other one is that, of course, uh, the robot can perceive observation, but then in order for it to interact with the world, it needs to perform actions. And then the effects of that actions might be uncertain as well. Uh, it might be because errors in its actuators, but it's also because it might not understand exactly well, what's the dynamics of the world that it is working in, for instance. It's particularly true if uh, the robot needs to work collabor collaboratively with humans, for instance. And again, this uncertainty in the effects of actions are captured as conditional probability function as this, uh, what might be the next state of the robot given the current state and the action it has performed. And the, we will also need to have some kind of reward function from where the objective function will be derived from because we do want to have good long-term return. Right? And obviously in addition to this, uh, there will be spaces like the state space, action space and observation spaces, which are the parameters of these functions. Now uh, for the POMDP to map from this observation to action or sequence of observation actions to the next action, uh, it's generally using two components inside it. Uh, so one part is about estimating the states, um, but the, uh, the main thing in this state estimate is that because of those uncertainty in the observations, uncertainty in the effects of actions, the robot may never know the exact state that it is in. And so in POMDP, we actually account for those uncertainty uh, as distribution over states. So, the state estimate is essentially what people usually call beliefs, which is a distribution over the underlying state space of the robot. And in POMDP, all of the uh, actions, uh, all of the inference, all of the action selection are essentially computed with respect to this uh, belief estimate of the states. So that's the key thing in, in POMDP. And uh, one thing is that if you look into this, perhaps if you come from control background, you will see this as a feedback controller. If you come from AI, this is a, an a, a rational agent. Uh, both of them are true, but the only thing is that the key point is really that in POMDP, we deal with beliefs, which is distribution over the underlying states. Um, so that's essentially what a POMDP is. And of course, when we say we want to solve a POMDP, it means that we want to compute the best policy, the best uh, mapping from beliefs to actions. And what best means is uh, satisfying this uh, optimization, which essentially just consists of two components. One is the easy to compute one, which is the expected immediate reward. The other part is the hard to compute, which is that uh, expected total future reward so that we can actually get good long-term return. Uh, so uh, this essentially means that we need to consider uh, the possible futures that the robot might be in. So we can imagine if we start from not knowing the exact state it is in, 
and we perform an action and the effect of this action might also be uncertain, then the robot might even be in much more diverse states. And from this diverse states, it might see different observations. And that's just one step. Right? But in robotics, usually we need to actually look into uh, many look ahead steps. It's quite common to require at least 20 steps, for instance. And so what that means is that we need to suddenly deal with uh, the with possible futures whose size grows exponentially with the number of look ahead steps that we need to perform. And that's actually sort of one of uh, sort of the reason why uh, computing the optimal solution for POMDP is quite difficult, it is computationally intractable, um, uh, uh, well, at least in the worst case. Right? Uh, but I guess what I'm going to talk about uh, after this is that uh, it's not all that bad. Uh, so we can actually make uh, get some good policies under the POMDP framework, though perhaps it's not exactly optimal. Um, uh, it's just a little bit, hopefully, so that people doesn't get uh, discouraged uh, at, at this point. So uh, this is sort of the progression that has happened in POMDP solving. Uh, so before 2003, uh, we can only solve this kind of simple navigation problem, perhaps like in three by four uh, grid cells. And even this will take actually many days, uh, almost a week, for instance, if you haven't run out of memory yet. Uh, then in 2003, there's this breakthrough that we can start solving problems uh, of target finding with 870 states, uh, but this actually takes 50 hours. And we actually look into this and develop uh, an algorithm uh, as well for improving this capability. And on this particular problem, we can solve this in just six seconds and get a better uh, policy quality than the one generated by this method in 50 hours. And uh, then if we can do that for 870 states, then we can start solving for much larger problems as well, uh, including like hundreds of thousands in, uh, in just a couple of hours. And so uh, since then, then there's uh, a bit of interest in POMDP. People have tried on different robotics problems. So for instance, for the study of next generation PCAS, uh, for picking up small objects and then uh, for human robot interaction. So put in this kind of scenario where the robot needs to hold the object while the person is painting uh, without knowing the exact way the person is going to paint and um, self-driving cars avoiding crowd, uh, in, uh, crowds. Uh, and then also in, this is actually coming from our group and I'm, I'm quite happy with this, uh, which is that we are trying to have ethologists to, um, to identify how bees avoid collision, how honeybees avoid collision. And it turns out that POMDP can be used to accentuate the data that have been gathered by, by the ethologists so that they, it can reduce the number of uh, animal experiments that they need to perform. And yeah, so these are some of the, um, the applications that POMDP have started seeing. So it's not that bad. It's no longer just this kind of problem. And so uh, the question is obviously what's, what, what makes it happen, right? What's the trick? Uh, so there's two things, I think. Uh, one is that close to optimal solution turns out to be good enough in many of these applications. And uh, what this means is that sampling can help a lot. So what, what it means, we actually only need to sample a few uh, beliefs and compute the best action for this few set of beliefs. And, and that's actually enough for us to get a good solution. Right? And we can extrapolate for all the beliefs that we haven't sampled. Of course, the question is, how do we sample well? So we want to have just a small number of beliefs where we compute this best, uh, best action from. Um, but uh, if we just do uniform random, for instance, that's that's unlikely to, to result in a good result, right? yeah, into good policy. Uh, so how do we sample well? So this is where uh, the robotics domain is actually helpful because there's uh, quite a structure there, even to uh, when even when we are working in unstructured environment, for instance. So the structure that I'm talking more is about, for instance, correlation or dependencies between observations, for instance, if we are using the same um, 
the same sensors, most probably we will have uh, the same uh, errors throughout or there's correlation in the errors. Uh, if we look into certain areas for several times from different, uh, different uh, views, then there will be also correlations in there, right? And then and there's also this nice property of physics in robotics because in robots we cannot just create our own physics like games, but uh, in robotics it has to adhere to this uh, physical uh, requirement, right? So, for instance, the continuity of motion. We don't expect that if I tell my robot to move one meter, it might have errors. It might not exactly move one meter, but I don't expect that to to be suddenly in APR within a second. Right? At least at the moment, I don't think we can do that. So uh, and then there's uh, so all this this kind of structures actually help us to be able to identify uh, the right sampling strategy or a suitable sampling strategy, and so that we can generate just from a small number of uh, sample beliefs, we can get quite a good uh, policy. Uh, so I'm saying good because, uh, as I mentioned before, it, it's not it, it's not the absolute optimal policy. I think we we sort of give up on that. Um, now these are sort of the high level tricks of what makes it what I think makes it work. Uh, but the there's obviously when we try to develop the algorithms to make it work, there's a lot of things that we need to handle. Uh, and I sort of try to classify them into the different um, issues that we need to, to deal with, especially if we want to make it work for robotics problems. So obviously there's the questions of scalability with respect to spaces, a state space, observation space, action space. And then there's also questions about uh, the changing model. So in general, uh, especially if we want the POMDP to work in suppose a new environment, uh, we may not uh, know the exact model, uh, the, the model of the environment, and it's quite tempting to basically try to incorporate all the unknowns uh, of the world as, as sort of like an uncertainty model, which then result in a huge uh, POMDP problem. Uh, well, the other way of dealing with it is that if we can somehow uh, just, just be honest that the model might change because at the moment we don't exactly know what's going on. Uh, so what that means is that we need to have a POMDP software that can actually be adaptable enough to this changing model. And so that's, uh, we look a little bit into that as well. And this is about the number of look ahead steps that we need to perform. Uh, and then the complex dynamics, I'm going to talk about this a little bit and also about the when the POMDP model is not available. I'm going to talk about this, uh, one of this work, uh, one of these two classes of work uh, here. And uh, so I've also tried to write this uh, sort of a summary of what has go gone on in the POMDPs, especially in POMDPs and robotics over the past uh, perhaps 15 years or so. Uh, and the summary and insights are in this paper. So a little bit of an effort perhaps. So, but uh, yeah, so, so if you are interested more, uh, it's in that paper. So going back to a little bit more of the technical details I, I want to talk about is I'm going to talk about this, uh, this particular work and, and this work. And so for the complex dynamics, uh, this is basically uh, the thesis of my uh, well, my, it, Marcus Horger, who used to be my PhD student and now is a postdoc at UQ, actually, at UQ School of Mathematics. Um, and so now the, uh, the issue with uh, complex dynamics is essentially when we start having the dynamics of the state, so basically the transition dynamics of moving from one state to another, being governed by <clears throat> functions, especially nonlinear functions, that has no closed form solution and computationally expensive to solve. So you can imagine this as something like a differential equation, for instance, right? And then uh, perhaps we can only solve these differential equations numerically. And then the question is, uh, how, how fast can we solve this numerically? Uh, so this is uh, appearing, for instance, if we even if we use physics engine, that physics engine usually is, well, essentially it is just an integrator of uh, the underlying differential equations of the physics. And so uh, with this physics engine, sometimes the computation can be quite, uh, uh, quite high. 
uh, and of course depends on how high the fidelity we want as well. Right? So, uh, so in the PomDP solving, it turns out that when we start having this kind of dynamics of the system that are expensive to compute, that really affects the computation. Uh, a lot. And uh, we found that this is actually true because of the generative model that uh, PomDP solving use. So if we are looking into reinforcement learning, for instance, generative model is also used a lot there. So, so there might be uh, issues there as well. So, uh, so just a little bit of the more uh, details, uh, where is this uh, difficulty coming in? So if we go back into the uh, the objective function we want to optimize, uh, something like this. So I basically just change the summation into the integration because now we are working with continuous uh, spaces. So that's also the other part of PomDP is that we it can actually be applied to both continuous and discrete space. Um, so the time domain will remain discrete. So uh, this particular component here uh, is expanded uh, to be is derived from this. So basically the, the combine of the transition dynamics and the observation likelihood. And this particular part here is usually where that issue with the complex dyna dynamics comes in. So then uh, how is this particular part going to affect our solving? So then if we go back a little bit into how uh, PomDP uh, solvers, the current PomDP solvers work. So there's essentially these two types of solvers these days, uh, offline and online. The offline means that we compute the policy uh, in advance. And once we uh, generate the policy, we basically have a mapping between beliefs from beliefs to actions, right? So basically uh, it's almost like a lookup table during execution. This is the belief estimate we have, then we just perform uh, the action that has been computed. Um, the online version, on the other hand, is basically trying to interleave between planning and execution. So the idea is I only need to compute the best action for the current beliefs that I'm in. So which means that I don't need to worry about storing the, the entire of the policy and that actually saves memory. Uh, and so in many of the offline software, the issues are, are no longer about time, but it's actually about the memory. Yes, despite of the, um, the advances in the memory that we have today. So now when we talk about offline, uh, both of these offline and online actually relies on these sample beliefs and what it essentially uh, boils down to when we look into the, the actual uh, working of the software is that we represent the sample beliefs as belief trees. And the way we sample, essentially we assume that we know the initial beliefs of these PomDPs. And then uh, we sample the actions and the observations because once we have action observations, we can apply the bias rule to actually compute the next belief. And that next belief is essentially the sample beliefs. So when we say we are sampling beliefs, essentially what we do is we are assuming that we know the initial belief and we are sampling action and observations. Now, in order for us to do, to do this, uh, to eventually get the next beliefs we are sampling after getting the actions and the observations, if we have the explicit representation of the transition function, which uh, many offline software uh, do, then uh, there's essentially no problem with the complex dynamics because you can just compute it based on the matrix multiplication. Uh, or, or, or if you have uh, this uh, continuous space, you can discretize them and then compute them later on. But if you are starting to use online software, then uh, you rely on the generative model. So the way it works is that now I'm going to uh, sample a particle or a state. So each of the beliefs is represented with particles or a set of states, right? And I'm going to sample a state from the particular initial belief, for instance. And then I'm going to select actions and observations, and then I will arrive to in another uh, another states, and that's a single st step. And from uh, from there, then the process repeats. And it, after I perform this for a number of steps, that's basically an episode that I have sampled. When I'm computing the, when I'm sampling the states and getting an action, and then observe, uh, and then uh, trying to compute the next state, then I actually need to run through my dynamics. Right? So, so this is where the, uh, the expensive dynamics computation matters 
because then that means in order for me to sample a single episode uh, going from so the sequence of action observation action observations in order for me to compute that uh, that's going to require calling the uh, dynamic solver for uh, for as many as the look ahead step we want if it's 10 look ahead step then for a single episode we need to call the dynamic solver 10 times but in addition to that, because uh, that's just a single episode, right? But we want to, in order for us to get a uh, statistical confidence for computing the policy, we generally need to, run, to sample these episodes as many as thousands in the order of thousands is generally sort of the, the minimum we need to do. And so what that means is that we end up with having to call the dynamic solver for tens of thousands in a single planning step. So that's, that's usually is quite uh, expensive if this computation is, is the dynamics computation itself is expensive. Um, so just to give an idea of the comparison. So on the left here is a typical benchmark in PomDB that many uh, have worked on. And this has actually been applied in, in real robot as well. Which is on the uh, on the one of the ICRA 2015 challenge on trying to demine um, an area. So the idea here is that if I have a robot that needs to pick up uh, to sample uh, good rocks, so these these black things here are rocks. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, and I, obviously in the beginning the robot doesn't know which one is good and which one is bad. Uh, so uh, in here, uh, the, the questions is the trade-off between going to a particular rock and trying to sample it uh, without knowing whether it's a good rock or a bad rock. And, uh, and so the dynamics of this, this is just a simple grid world. So the dynamics is really just left, right, up, down. So you can, you can think of perhaps just a factor displacement. And so the, uh, the computation for that transition dynamics compared to the entire planning time using a typical online solver is, is less than 10%. But once we start using this kind of robots and uh, we want to do perhaps force control with it, then the computation uh, for that dynamics uh, component compared to the entire planning time shoots up to almost 90%. So, so the characteristic of the problem changes once we start having to play with this kind of uh, kind of robot, this kind of robot, or perhaps with um, with a more complex dynamics uh, of the of the world. So it doesn't just always uh, need to be the robot, but it can also be other things in, in the world. Um, so when these kind of time complexity characteristics changes substantially. What that means is that the number of uh, sampled episodes we can perform for this kind of problems is substantially reduced. And what that means is that we also generally cannot perform as many look ahead steps as we need. And that result in a worse estimate in our value function and then a worse policy uh, result. A policy, uh, the resulting policy we compute is, uh, is also uh, worse performance. And so obviously one way of, of uh, trying to alleviate this issue is simplifying the dynamics. In fact, there has been quite a number of work on that. So linearized, right? So this is sort of one of the typical way uh, when we start having complex dynamics, perhaps we simplify them by linearizing them. Um, the issue we found with this is that when we start wanting to work near constraints, so this is near obstacles or near the torque limits. Uh, so if we think about having a car race problems where we need to operate near the, the limit of the, of the acceleration, uh, the velocity. And then uh, we, we generally, do, uh, the linearization generally doesn't perform well at all uh, because the linearization usually also assume that then we will have a nice distribution, for instance, like Gaussian distribution. And uh, that's just not true when we start working near constraints because there's a lot of bifurcation happening. And so that the belief estimate we have is generally totally off if we linearize the system. <clears throat> 
And so what we propose here is that we look into how we can propose a metric for identifying when can we run linearization, when can we not, and then perhaps combine the linearized version and the, the linearized dynamic and the original dynamics. And that's uh, one of our first work in looking into this. Um, but then after that, we look into the possibility of using multiple fidelities of the dynamics. So if we are using, if we are thinking of the physics engine as our dynamics computation, right? So in physics engines, there's usually these parameters of delta T that basically essentially is how we find is our uh, numerical integration is. Uh, so we can actually play with that parameters uh, to indicate how high a fidelity we actually want to use. And that's exactly what we are proposing here is that perhaps we can have a spectrum of fidelity in terms of the dynamics equation. And we obviously the higher the fidelity, the more expensive it is, but the better the result is. And the opposite is also true. And the idea is that we want to be able to use the low fidelity as much as possible and only use the high fidelity only sparingly. And that's and apparently we can do that uh, by the help of this multi-level Monte Carlo. Um, perhaps a little bit about what this multi-level Monte Carlo is. Uh, it's, it's essentially a way to compute expected value of random variables by uh, utilizing the linearization of expectation of property. So it's, uh, it's basically just expanded. And the idea is that I can then estimate this expected value by, uh, by a number of this, uh, by summation of the uh, lowest fidelity uh, dynamics, for instance. This is the random variable associated with the estimates based on uh, low fidelity. And then also as I go up, so as I in, uh, the index, uh, the lower index here indicates how high a fidelity I, I want to have. And then in here is basically the difference between the two, the two models. And so this basically helps us to have a low covariance. And in, in the end of the day, we can, so if we look into the results from the MLMC community, it turns out with a small number of, sorry, with a large number of low fidelity um, simulators and low fidelity models. And with a large number of samples from low fidelity models, then we can, and a small number of samples from high fidelity models, we can actually approximate the actual expected value uh, quite closely. So that's the property that we are sort of, uh, sort of trying to get at. So, so if I go back to that uh, online software, the way we actually do the sampling in that online software, that essentially just means that uh, those estimate, uh, the expected values we are looking at are, this estimate of the Q values. And that estimate of the Q values then can be expanded using uh, the MLMC we had just see uh, as something like this, which essentially means that I can actually sample the episodes using different uh, transition dynamics. Uh, one transition dynamics would have low fidelity and then the next might have higher fidelity and all the way until the highest fidelity, which is the original equation. And so if I do it that way, uh, then that means uh, we are actually able to sample a large number with a large number of samples from the low fidelity uh, transition dynamics and just a small sample from this uh, high fidelity, we can actually approximate the Q values uh, or estimate the Q values uh, of a particular beliefs uh, and action quite well. And that's, that's basically what happened. Um, the, uh, the algorithm itself, once we figure that out, becomes quite simple. It's just that we first need to sample coarsely using the lowest fidelity model. And then once we have that, then we want to sample a particular fidelity level. And once we sample that particular uh, fidelity level, we sample two correlated episodes uh, using one uh, using fidelity level that differs only by, by one levels of fidelity that we have. 
So this will ensure the correlated samples that, that is required by the multi-level Monte Carlo. And this will later on reduce the variance that we have, which is, well, it's still a Monte Carlo method. So we, we usually want to, uh, to do variance reduction as well. Uh, so one thing is that when we say correlated samples, essentially we just use the same uh, actions to sample, and uh, that's basically where the correlation will come from. Uh, but we still sample the observations as per uh, the models. So this is just one of the, the results that we have. So we compare uh, on on four degrees of freedom robot needs to, that needs to operate near obstacles uh, that are quite cluttered, similarly with this KUKA model. And also uh, this one is a second order dynamics for car navigation that needs to go from here to this green uh, region. Um, observation can only be gotten from, uh, from here and here, and it needs to avoid the obstacles which are colored with, with blacks here. And similarly, this is actually a model for our Kinova MOFO, and it needs to pick up this particular red, um, red circle, uh, sorry, red uh, cube, uh, uh, without colliding with any of the obstacles here. And we compare, so ABT is the basis that we build our, our software on, and POMCP is the state of the art that, uh, that, that is uh, for POM, online POMCP software. And so this is the expected total reward, which uh, indicates that we can actually achieve a much better result. And this actually affects the percentage of success as well, which is available in the paper. Uh, so, uh, so this basically indicates that we actually, sorry, if we look into the number of samples from the different, um, from the different fidelity levels we use, it's quite clear that when we use this, we actually use quite a lot from the low fidelity, which is fast to compute and just a small number from the high fidelity. But despite of using sort of an uh, not so good dynamics model, it turns out that we can still generate a better policy than the state of the art methods. And so that's basically what I wanted to talk about on this particular component. Uh, so the other one is about uh, when the POMDP model is not available. Uh, so by the way, if there's any questions, I'm happy to just answer it directly rather than waiting to the end. Uh, but if there's no question, I'll just move on. So in here, uh, so far we talk about solving a POMDP. So we need to have those transition model, observation model, and then the reward function as well. But uh, sometimes those models are not that easy to, to get. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, what my PhD student at the moment is doing, Nick Collins. Um, he is likely to be in the job market next year. So uh, a little bit of advertisement for him. Uh, and so now uh, the idea in what he's doing is that we want to be able to combine the planning and the model learning in, in end to end. So, this is uh, this idea of end-to-end -end model plan, uh, model learning and planning is, is not new. There, there's methods for this, and it turns out if we look into uh, optimizing this uh, this equation, so this is actually the fully observed um, version, so the optimization for the fully observed version of the POMDP. Uh, so rather than beliefs, we have states. And uh, we can actually see this as a convolution. And so it's, it's, it fits quite well with the convolution neural net and also with RNN later on a little bit. And so now the summation, well, we just sum them up, right? Um, and maximization is just a max pool. And the thing is that if we do value iteration, uh, what that means, we need to have this, this, uh, this single iteration here as a single layer uh, of an RNN. And if we want to run multiple iteration for uh, satisfying the value iteration, uh, so for me making the value iteration, then we basically have additional layers. So each layer in the RNN uh, essentially represents a single iteration in value iteration. And if we represent it that way, then we basically can do both model uh, learning and planning end to end uh, in, we, in, uh, in, well, 
relatively good with relatively good results. And this has been done for the fully observed version, value iteration network, and for the POMDP version, which is this QMDP net. Now, the issue is uh, when they do this convolution, both of those methods, when they do this convolution, uh, the idea is that this transition function that they need to learn uh, actually becomes the kernel. So this is basically the weights that the neural net needs to learn. And obviously what that means, we want to have a small number of weights as possible so that we can learn with small number of data, for instance, and also fast. And so the simplification they have made is that uh, they actually assume that the transition model no longer depends on the state, but it, also, it only depends on the action, which yes, it reduced the number of weights that we need to learn, but by the same token, it actually reduced the uh, richness of the representation as well. And so that's basically what we are trying to address in this particular paper. Uh, the idea here is that uh, it turns out we, if we look into this particular uh, for propagation primitive is being used in many different places as well. So if we can actually make this more efficient, then we basically uh, gain uh, efficiency in multiple different places of this end-to-end -end, uh, planning and learning. And well, we want to utilize some local structure because we know that uh, this is where the continuity of motion helps, right? In terms of the transition dynamics, for instance, we know that uh, we are not going to suddenly jump to the end of the world with, with robots, for instance. And so if I go back to the POMDP value function, so this is the value function that, that we have in the beginning, and then uh, which is what we want to optimize for POMDPs. And this is the belief update equation. So this is what the next belief should look like and so how we can compute the next belief. Uh, perhaps one thing this, this theta here is really just a um, uh, normalizing factor. And this can be opened up into this one. And so this particular part here happens in two places uh, and this is, what I meant by this primitive actually happens in multiple different places. One is in the propagation of the value function itself when we are doing the value iteration. The other is actually in the belief update for POMDPs. And that's, so the idea that we want is that we want to be able to represent this LCI net. Uh, sorry, we propose a, a new layer in neural network, which is essentially, uh, we represent the transition as the uh, a weight for this conditional probability function uh, to perform action A, given we were in state uh, S, and look into the displacement that will happen. So this is the DS with respect to the uh, initial state we were in. So, so we propose a layer that really just doing this uh, with a little bit of a more um, efficiency in some of the computation. And then, uh, and so that's essentially we use a lot of the shifting operation because <clears throat> we realized that uh, many of these transition dynamics actually, uh, when we want to propagate the value function, it's really just we are shifting the values uh, forward uh, by a particular uh, rule, by a particular pattern. So, and shift operation is, is fast. And, and so that's what we sort of uh, try to do. So once we do that shifting, then the uh, computation, uh, obviously we need to, uh, to do a convolution with the value that we want to propagate. And that's what we do in here. So that in the end, we get the resulting propagated value. And this resulting propagated value can be the value function itself, or it can be the beliefs depending on where this is being used. And once we have that, then essentially what we change from the existing value iteration network and also the QMDP net is that uh, we essentially add that uh, particular new layer to, to this one component. And this is for the value iteration network. Uh, and so this value propagation is, so this value iteration is also used in QMDP net. But in QMDP net, uh, because it's POMDP, it has an additional components, which is to estimate the belief. And so in that estimation of the belief, we also insert that new layer in here. 
And once we have that, uh, we, we try on a number of different problems. This is a dynamic environment where uh, this, this slight gray basically indicates some places might be closed so the, uh, and the robot doesn't know which one is closed in the beginning. Uh, it needs to go from the red uh, circle to the blue circle. And this is the percentage of success that the QMDP net uh, provide. And this is if we just add that particular LCI net layer to the QMDP net, uh, Q, the entire of the QMDP net end to end, then we gain this much improvement. And the total training time is actually less as well. Uh, so this is sort of the benefit of being able to exploit the, the fact that, well, it's going to be local and, and we incorporate that information of locality into the learning of the neural net. And so we are also looking into how we can generalize. So we actually train with this kind of small uh, grid environment, but we evaluate on this more realistic environment, which is data set from the real laser data. And again, if we look into the value iteration network, this is the success rate. But if we just add the additional layer that we have uh, with the LCI net, then this is the improvement we can make. Uh, we have many other results that are available in the paper that I'm not going to touch now, um, but perhaps just the generalization again, but for the partially observed version, then again, uh, this is this part is if we just add that small uh, additional uh, layer to the QMDP net. Uh, and so obviously when, because in POMDP, we actually uh, can apply this additional layer in two different components, whereas in the value iteration network is only on one component, then we gain more in uh, POMDP solving. And in addition to that, perhaps what's interesting is that, uh, it seems like just an, a small addition to the entire pipeline, but that small addition, uh, because we can identify that it actually appears often and, and it actually appears in multiple different places, then the gain that we can get is quite high. And so, so I think it's, it's useful uh, when we look into this kind of end-to-end -end or uh, neural nets to be able to break it apart and to see uh, just like when we do algorithms before, right? Which is that we know what are the primitive computation in here, what are the primitive blocks in the, in the neural net. And if we can identify them, then perhaps just looking into improving one components can actually gain quite a lot. And so that's basically that second part I want to talk about. And with that, I'm actually done. So perhaps if you forget everything I say, uh, perhaps just these two things uh, that POMDP has now become practical for uh, quite a number of realistic robotics problems. Uh, of course, there's always caveat, uh, that's so to some extent, right? Um, and a little bit of an advertisement, perhaps. These are some of the summary and insight we have gotten. We, uh, I wrote it in this paper. And so hopefully that also helps to sort of um, make people a little bit uh, a little bit uh, seeing that there's actually perhaps uh, this POMDP is no longer those useless things that people used to think. Um, and with that, uh, I'm, I'm not talking here, but actually my students and postdoc are working hard in, in, the, in the lab. So uh, thanks to them that all this can happen. And that's, that's basically it. Oh, with that, I actually have openings as well. But, so if you are interested, I'm happy to uh, talk about them as well. And with that, I'm done. Thanks, Anna. Uh, that was a great talk. Um, so we have time for questions. So if uh, anyone has a, has a question, uh, unmute yourself or put your hand up. Um, Ian, has a question? Yeah, thanks, Anna. I'll kick things off, I guess. Um, it's a great presentation. I, I guess when um, we look at what's kind of evolved with um, things in the area of reinforcement learning, which is kind of similar to POMDP, but just with value functions over the state space, not the belief space, we see kind of one, perhaps one of the big leaps has been in finding um, good architectures for representation of value functions. Um, Cause that's, I mean, really what you're trying to do is estimate a value function, right? What do we know about 
what value functions look like in the belief space because that's obviously much higher dimensional yeah. but at the same time as i think you mentioned at some point in any real practical problem most kind of possible beliefs in the belief space are kind of ridiculous practically you really should be looking at a narrower range yeah so yeah. this should somehow be in the representation but uh yeah. i don't yeah. know kind of an open question what do we know about what how how in a in a real world continuous 3d robotics problem what should the actual functional representation of V or Q look like? Yeah, uh, that's a, a good question. And, and as you mentioned, it is uh, sort of an open problem. I mean, obviously, if we have that answer, that's that's great. Uh, but from our experience in, in here, for instance, so you see the value function, uh, the I think one of the issues perhaps is we are so used to having the representation as just uh, as just grids for neural net, right? So, so it comes from the from the fission, and so everything is RGB, which is nice. But then uh, that basically means that we actually lose the capability of saying that this part of the beliefs you need to consider that uh, much more than the other parts. And so, so, so that's actually how the POMDP can actually make, um, can become much more practical is indeed because we identify that some part of the beliefs are more important than others, essentially. That's what the sampling is telling us, right? And uh, so I think if I need to make a bet, so the representation we want is a flexible enough representation that would allow us to incorporate this kind of information that that we that we shouldn't just use everything as as grid, uh, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, things like graphical neural net, for instance, are potentials. I think uh, mm -hmm. so. So that that's in terms of representation. Right? In terms of the exact how the landscape of the value function looks like in mm -hmm. the belief space, um, I honestly don't know, but I can have a guess. <laughs> Uh, I can have a guess. So it really depends on one is the sparsity of your models, like the transition function and the observation function, and also the reward function. And so if your model is quite sparse, generally you, you might be able to have like a, a nice, um, uh, so, so, so one thing is, okay, sorry, one thing that I forgot to mention, the POMDP has this nice uh, convex, piecewise linear convex value function. Uh, so, so you're guaranteed that, that, uh, that your optimal solution will be convex and it's piecewise linear, or, or at least it can be arbitrarily, it can be approximately approximated arbitrarily closely with uh, this uh, piecewise linear convex function, depending on the type of, so perhaps if I can go here. So depending on this value function, so, so the one that I present here is a particular type of, of objective function, which is the infinite horizon one, because that's usually easier. That means our policy is stationary. Uh, the optimal policy is stationary, so we only need to compute one. But if, uh, if we actually have, for instance, a finite horizon, which, is, uh, which means that we actually need a, a non-stationary policy, then we we can still uh, we can uh, we can actually get sorry for the finite horizon we can actually uh, we know that this optimal value function is piecewise piecewise linear convex and for this kind of value function it can be approximated arbitrarily closely with piecewise linear convex so it will be convex with respect to the belief function but just because it's convex it doesn't means it's it's uh, easy to compute because the thing is that the estimation of this value function itself is still a problem. So, so we don't actually have an explicit value function. That's one of the issue, I think. And, uh, and yeah, so, so usually if we have quite a, quite a sparse problem, uh, there might be like a small components that are very important that has a very high reward and is indicating that the rest of the, in the rest of the time domain, it will also uh, build up. So it accumulates into the optimal uh, function, uh, sorry, the optimal part of the, of the functions, right? And that's usually easier to, to get. 
uh, and then there's also this uh, quite a number of of characteristics that we can look into that might make uh, sampling easier for this type of problems, for instance. And that's actually dependent on the type of the transition function, the type of the observation function. And so if we want to look into this, this I believe people in control might, might look a lot as well. Uh, mm -hmm. There's things like circular matrix that will actually yeah. make, if the problem, uh, the transition is circular matrix, then you can actually uh, compute this uh, quite easily. So, mm -hmm. so, so those are some of the things that, uh, some of the structures that I think could be exploited. Uh, we sort of use that in, in the sampling, um, but I don't think it's used in the neural net representation. And I have no idea. At the moment, I don't know how to, to incorporate that. Great, <laughs> thanks, Anna. So, yeah, so, sorry, a bit long answer. <laughs> Uh, Gordon. Hi, thanks, Hannah, for an excellent talk. Okay, I learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, so, at some point, you mentioned uh, you had a work regarding online uh, solving of Palm DP, right? I wonder if you can clarify what online means. So, oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yes, so online really, um, uh -huh. we interleave between the computing the policy and the execution of the policy. So mm -hmm. what that but means? What is the need for that, right? So this palm DP is based on a model of the observation and the state translations, right? Yep. And it, it, offline is effectively you compute an optimal or suboptimal, uh, I think, a solution that is stationary a policy, right? Mm -hmm. Then, then during the execution, a robot builds. Suppose that is the case. We we'll only need to know the policy, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the offline, we compute this policy ahead of time. And then during execution, we basically just use the, this policy which, so we estimate the belief and then we see the policy. If I'm in this belief, what do I need to do? That's offline, right? So I basically have computed yes, the entire, the policy policy, really offline, the entire right? mapping from beliefs to action. Now, the issue with that is that usually it hits the memory limit. So because I need to somehow represent the entire mapping from beliefs to action, Yes. Or at least beliefs reachable from initial belief, right? Under the policy. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, with online, we basically say, well, actually, I only need to know the best action to perform from the current belief, right? So I will only focus on getting the best action from this current belief. And I don't care about what the other beliefs uh, will say. So what this means is that indeed, in order for me to be able to compute best action for the current belief, I actually need to know the future as well because of this, this particular part of the value function. Yes. Yes. But that means I can actually relax that a lot. So uh, if, especially if I use this infinite horizon problem, then if it's a longer, uh, the, the distance is quite far, then the effect of this is going, going to be quite small, right? So basically that's where we win is because we can start saying, well, I only need to know what's best for this particular belief, right? So that means I can actually ignore uh, uh, quite a bit on other parts of the beliefs that may not have such a high impact on the computation on the value function for the current belief. Mm -hmm. And that makes it faster. And uh, I don't need to, uh, to maintain the entire uh, mapping for the entire beliefs as well. I think there's some analogy to what is also done in kind of stochastic model predictive control, yeah, where yeah, the, yeah. the doing an MPC mm -hmm. where you're evaluating some rollouts um, uh -huh. with some candidate policies. This is kind of an online process as opposed to trying to compute an explicit feedback and policy offline, right? And then typically, mm -hmm. the longer you roll out into the future, the mm -hmm cruder you can have the value function estimates in the, yeah. the distant future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Uh, if anyone at the Rose Street um, has a question, feel free to speak up. If not, then uh, it's on past one o'clock. Uh, thank you. Very much, Hannah. That was a great talk. My pleasure.